There have been plenty of developments since we last came to you uh, with Daily Debrief on People's Dispatch in Israel, in Gaza, of course, uh, and around the world, the scale of the humanitarian crisis that the Gazan people are facing and the tragic reality of life in Gaza today unfolds in full view of the world. Uh, but what exactly is being done by world leadership to combat the increasing scale of this catastrophe? What are the most important developments from a humanitarian, a political and a diplomatic perspective? Uh, and what should we be talking about uh, today? That's our lead story, as it has been on Daily Debrief uh, since the current conflict between Hamas uh, and Israel continued and Israel began its all-out siege and offensive of Gaza, as well as the occupied territories and the West Bank. Uh, we also have today uh, results of the referendum in Australia, where a majority of uh, citizens or voters there have rejected the voice referendum, which sought a constitutional amendment to create a body of indigenous people to advise uh, parliament as well as the Australian government on issues that affect indigenous uh, communities. A majority of voters in all six Australian states voted no. What does this mean for the rights of First Nation communities in Australia? And in Geneva, the World Congress of Public Services International is being held. Uh, we reported, of course, earlier uh, last week on a protest by health workers ahead of the official start of the Congress. Uh, today, we asked Jyotsna Singh, who is in Geneva and attending uh, that Congress, what public services uh, workers around the world are talking about, what are the issues they are facing, and what are they demanding from political leadership. Uh, Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief, brought to you by People's Dispatch. Take a second before we begin to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Right, as I was saying at the top of the show, uh, plenty has been happening in Gaza uh, and in the region in West Asia, as well as around the world, uh, in uh, response and reaction to Israel's all-out siege of the Gaza Strip, uh, its continued suppression in the occupied territories, West Bank, uh, particularly mass arrests are being reported there. Uh, there have also been, there has also been some talks of a potential visit by US President Joe Biden to the region after what can be, or what many commentators are regarding as the failed diplomatic visit of US Secretary of State Antti Blinken uh, to Israel, as well as to Jordan, where he met with Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud, uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, and other leaders. He also spoke with uh, Egypt's al-Sisi, uh, Saudi Arabia and others. Uh, Anish has been covering uh, these developments from all perspectives. Uh, from the humanitarian perspective, from the diplomatic perspective, and of course, from the political perspective as well. Uh, Anish, uh, not a very insightful question maybe, but let's start since we've had a bit of a break uh, with the latest updates and uh, on the harrowing, the tragic situation that, that uh, Gazans are facing uh, today. Yes, yeah, so the uh, the escalation has gone uh, even further now. What we're looking at uh, is the siege uh, reaching a point where you can have uh, you know a humanitarian uh, crisis that will be much bigger than uh, perhaps the bombings itself. Uh, the WHO has said that uh, almost all uh, hospitals are very fast running out of fuel. And if they do not, uh, if there is no end to the fuel uh, embargo in the next 24 hours, uh, pretty much no hospital in uh, Gaza will have any access to fuel, or with which uh, we mean that there will be no power for them to run uh, some of the most essential emergency services. Uh, at the same time, uh, hospitals are talking about uh, you know running out of all sorts of supplies not just medicines and equipment, but also uh, water. Drinking water is something that uh, there have been reports of many doctors trying to find and search for them. Uh, there is also the fact that, uh, you know, the border closure continues. Uh, there is a large exodus of people that is happening now, fearing a ground invasion in northern parts of Gaza, which is the most heavily populated, the most 
uh, areas of the Gaza Strip, uh, including uh, which includes Gaza City as well. So a large number of people are moving south. Many have reached the Rafah border uh, with Egypt, uh, which is which continues to be closed, uh, except for you know some delivery of essential supplies, but. Uh, very rare, most of which is uh, not allowed by the Egyptian government either. So uh, the fact that the Rafah border continues to be closed uh, uh, despite the large exodus of uh, displaced peoples uh, it clearly shows that this crisis is going to be much, much bigger than uh, what anybody would have calculated at the moment. Uh, at the same time, what we're seeing is Israel continuing to make all sorts of very inflammatory statements uh, about uh, wanting to clear down uh, on Sunday, uh, clear down the whole of Gaza. Uh, on Sunday, we actually saw one of the most intense bombings of Gaza uh, in uh, since the whole uh, incident uh, began uh, in October on October 7th, so uh, which has actually leveled entire neighborhoods. Uh, and at the same time, Israel has started, uh, you know, a violent crackdown on any kind of protest or mobilization in the West Bank. Uh, so far, according to the Palestinian Authority, 58 people have been killed and uh, more than a thousand people or 2000 people actually uh, have been injured by the kind of violent crackdowns that uh, that are being witnessed right now in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. Uh, refugee uh, camps are being raided very regularly, more regularly than uh, it used to be uh, just a couple of uh, weeks ago. And this is despite the uh, fact that we are talking about a time when uh, attacks on, uh, you know, occupied territories and attacks on the occupied peoples uh, and villages and residential areas have intensified over the last few years. So what we are looking at is an overall uh, escalation of crisis, very wanton uh, escalation of crisis by Israel, and it barely and the, all that talk about wanting the refugees, uh, sorry, hostages that Hamas fighters had uh, allegedly ta had taken uh, into Gaza be released uh, is also uh, being uh, you know refuted and, uh, with the kind of reports that we're seeing right now, uh, with at least a dozen uh, reportedly killed by Israeli bombings themselves. So it clearly shows that Israel uh, doesn't really care about its own people who are, uh, you know, uh, taken hostages by Hamas. Uh, and the fact that it is not going to uh, show any kind of signs for allowing a ceasefire for any humanitarian aid to go in, uh, which was made clear uh, by statement recently, uh, shows that Israel just wants to continue to escalate the situation to a point where it is uh, there is no return, possible return uh, to uh, you know status quo ante. Uh, Anish, uh, a lot has been happening on the diplomatic front uh, as well uh, since we last spoke with you. Uh, we had, of course, mentioned some aspects of uh, Blink uh, the initial stages of Anthony Blinken's uh, visit there. Uh, the, the U.S. is once again trying to play. The, the policeman or, or the monitor uh, in the region, despite what is apparent to, I think, uh, many of the rest of us is, is a, a failure of its, uh, you know, diplomatic efforts uh, in the region. The response from West Asian countries, uh, from Gulf uh, region countries, has been uh, different from what it has been in the recent past. Uh, clear inclination there that they are not willing to uh, blindly to uh, the U.S. line, uh, put all of that into perspective for us a little bit uh, over the course of his visit. Uh, who all did Blinken meet and, and what was the sort of content of uh, some of those conversations and, and any sort of results from it? Well, what we can see is uh, that the Blinken tour, actually, uh, of uh, many of the West Asian countries uh, did not really yield the kind of results uh, that the U.S. intended it would have. Uh, many of these countries are already, you know, very strong allies, even military allies of the United States, and many of them have supported uh, U.S. and U.S. supported uh, or U.S.-centric policies in the region as well. 
So uh, what they banked on was uh, there will be a sort of muted criticism at the very least of the Israeli uh, attack on Gaza. Uh, but that is not happening right now. In, on the, in the meanwhile, the kind of feedback and the kind of responses that Blinken got uh, uh, probably affected even the president's stand very, uh, very shortly, a uh, short while ago, he actually made a statement uh, that uh, it would be a disaster or a catastrophe to actually, and a big mistake, uh, that's what the uh, quote says, it would be a big mistake to for Israel to send in ground troops into Gaza. So that uh, clearly shows a certain mellowing down of, uh, you know, you have stand primarily uh, coming from pressures from West Asian allies. Uh, many of whom like control a uh, whole host of resources that uh, and also uh, very geostrategic uh, networks of trade and transport that the U.S. definitely banks on. And for them to be uh, isolate or, or you know, uh, uh, any kind of uh, or alienated at the moment will not be in their best interest. But at the same time, U.S. has uh, a very official policy of supporting Israel, whatever comes. Uh, it, uh, over the weekend, we saw U.S. actually sending, uh, saying that it will be sending a second uh, aircraft carrier to uh, the west, uh, in the eastern Mediterranean region, uh, and that is pretty much uh, in response to statements being made by Hezbollah and also the government of Iran, and that clearly shows that uh, there is a chance of uh, a, a, a massive escalation in the uh, region-wide escalation of the conflict that the U.S. is expecting if a ground uh, invasion happens. And that is pretty much the red line right now that uh, Israel is wanting to cross, but the West is not very keen on doing that at the moment. So what we're looking at is uh, U.S. being caught between a very difficult place, uh, actually two uh, very difficult places and it is not uh, very clear how to move forward with it. It is a very confused policy at the moment because it has to juggle b b between both of them and also the fact that there is a massive support uh, among the political elite at the very least uh, for uh, the Zionist uh, project. So it uh, it is pretty much uh, you know caught up in its own sort of web uh, of, uh, you know, creating a very problematic alliances in the region that is now catching up to it in this current situation. Anish, we also uh, saw reports and, and the way in which ordinary Israeli citizens are responding uh, to the present government. We've seen widespread sort of uh, antipathy, of course, uh, over the course of uh, the past several weeks and months to the kind of uh, policies uh, and and sort of changes that the Netanyahu led uh, government was trying to uh, bring into force in Israel. Uh, we've seen ministers uh, who were trying to visit the injured at hospitals uh, being sort of uh, told in uh, unequivocal terms that the government has completely mismanaged and exacerbated uh, this crisis. What is the current political scenario in Israel? Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, there, there, there is the overwhelming sense that the people uh, of Israel are, are united, but, but it's not 100% uh, like that. There have been uh, voices and loud and prominent voices advocating for uh, peace. It's a very difficult situation, definitely. Uh, a large part of uh, the kind of narrative that goes around in Israel right now is the fact that is how they're uh, looking at uh, Netanyahu's failure in uh, containing what they see, what they see as threat from Hamas, and uh, a lot of details and reports about the situation about. Uh, the Hamas incursion into Israeli territories actually uh, have caused and, uh, you know, exacerbated that kind of criticism. But at the same time, uh, what you're looking at is uh, the, uh, the same block, the same nationalist kind of narrative also is calling for the, the war cabinet to actually go for an all-out war on Gaza. So it is a very polarized situation, uh, a very, you know, kind of a, a, where, a polarized situation where the sort of rabid, a very ultra-nationalist 
you know, very ultra Zionist uh, narratives are the most loud uh, ones in the current scenario and that, who dominate uh, pretty much every other, uh, you know, uh, voices over uh, and talk over every other voices, even those of peace. So it is not a very pretty scene for uh, within Israel to begin with. So uh, what uh, we do not know how far the Israeli government is ready to go in actually uh, satiating these voices. Uh, but uh, right now, what we have seen so far uh, with the mobilization of troops, the mobilization of reservists, uh, it is not a, uh, going to be a very pretty picture uh, in the coming days. All right, Anish. Uh, thanks very much for those uh, those updates, and and we will continue uh, with you to to cover developments in Gaza and in Israel uh, over the next few days. But but we'll move on now uh, to our second story of the day, which is a, a vital story coming in from Australia, one that we've covered uh, on daily debrief uh, before uh, in the build up to this referendum that was held on October fourteenth uh, across the country because it pertained to a constitutional amendment that allowed for the creation of an elected advisory body representing the indigenous communities of Australia, Torres Strait's uh, Islanders, uh, to advise parliament on issues that pertain to them, uh, that impact them, whether it's on a policy level uh, or a legal uh, lawmaking legislative level, um, or even perhaps even a discourse level an inclusive uh, sort of idea to give indigenous communities first nations communities the kind of voice uh, in uh, the parliamentary uh, electoral system that they deserve and that they have been struggling for uh, this process anish started a while ago with the uluru uh, statement of the heart and it has come to a sort of uh, at least a midpoint in, in the sense that a majority of those with the right to vote in Australia and those who came out to vote across all six states uh, have said no. Uh, so tell us first how uh, this campaign sort of unfolded and, and how did the, the, the no voters win in the end? Well, one of the things uh, that we need to understand is that the no vote uh, started becoming, and the you know the support for the no vote started becoming quite dominant only in the past few months. If you look at uh, the opinion polls, uh, even before uh, the the referendum was announced, uh, since August last year, uh, the yes vote and support for a voice, uh, indigenous voice, was overwhelming uh, across Australia. In, in fact, most uh, states actually had a majority of uh, those who were surveyed uh, supporting it. And obviously that, you know, came down uh, drastically uh, since about uh, May, June, uh, when a, a certain kind of narrative started taking hold. Uh, the right wing actually started using a certain cert set of talking points. Uh, some started claiming that uh, the voice would actually uh, institute a, so a sort of apartheid within Australia, a very, uh, you know, specious argument, but definitely something that took hold. Uh, a lot of fake news was uh, and disinformation was being generated at the time. Uh, we also saw uh, the entire Murdoch media up in action at the time, uh, being completely opposed and, you know, using all sorts of means to undermine uh, the yes vote and the support for the indigenous voice. And uh, we must remember that the Burdock media uh, actually do have a, a sort of virtual monopoly on, uh, on press. Uh, in Australia, there, is, uh, there has always been this debate that Australian media is, you know, kind of uh, lacking in media diversity. Uh, primarily with ownership diversity and the fact that uh, you know Murdoch Media pretty much holds nearly two thirds of uh, you know the press of uh, in the, in the country clearly shows that they are dominant uh, uh, in a manner which overwhelms every others and so if they take a stand so strongly in opposition they are definitely changing opinions of the people and the, on the other hand you had uh, you know very uh, very flashy ads. Uh, you know, very, uh, you know, very uh, advanced kind of uh, advertisement against the voice. Uh, and that pretty much did give results eventually 
uh it wasn't until uh, a few a couple of months ago that the voice uh, the opposition actually started gaining uh, a lead over the yes votes and now what we've seen the result is that a no overwhelming number has uh, voted no but at the same time uh, what, uh you can actually also see is uh, all that statement a lot of the statements being made at the time uh, were debunked but one uh, very crucial thing was uh this attempt to project that most of the indigenous communities or aboriginal peoples in australia were not in support of the voice uh for various reasons they said that some did not think that the voice would be effective some did not think that uh these symbolic gestures would make any difference uh but uh what we see right now is that every uh, electoral district every uh you know small unit where uh administrative unit where indigenous people are an overwhelming majority or at least a majority uh, in terms of demographics have voted overwhelmingly in favor of the voice and uh, in in fact in northern territory where uh, you know indigenous people have a significant or a significantly large minority uh, they uh, there was a very narrow a smaller margin much smaller than the national average uh uh be between the yes and the no vote so it clearly shows that the indigenous peoples wanted this but definitely the fact that the non indigenous settler uh descendants of settler colonial uh colonial people it has actually won over uh, has been won over to the no side and that that is definitely going to make an impact on how things are going to move forward because one of the things that it has cutled is uh this one in a you know one in in a century kind of uh attempt to have the indigenous people be recognized as first peoples of australia uh, uh in the constitution and that sort of recognition would have had a massive uh impact in terms of reparations and you know even recognizing their right over the land that have been colonized over the past several centuries and so definitely that has been scuttled and that is that is a major setback uh, that it will be very difficult to surpass uh, or you know overcome in the coming years mm. so so where does it go uh, from here anish the struggle for uh, true representation within what is uh, the system in australia uh, because you know lip service has been paid we we talked i think a, a couple of months ago when i was Uh, there in reporting on the the women's football world cup that all of those games and these events begin uh, by an acknowledgement that the lands on which they are taking place are uh, lands that were originally belonging to these first nations communities uh, but but very little beyond that lip service so 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 in terms of the struggle for actual rights and representation where does where do things go from here well we have to wait and see because uh, obviously as i said that this constitutional amendment to recognize uh, the aboriginal people as the first peoples uh, has been scuttled but nevertheless a different kind of uh, if the government is serious about uh, having a voice uh, an indigenous voice in the parliament they can to take a legislative route without having uh, a sort you know this recognition part but having a sort of uh, you know an, probably an elected uh, advisory body uh that will advise the parliament and uh, through the legislative uh, through a legislative route that is not difficult the, but there are other pressing concerns that the indigenous people have taken uh, up especially uh, what as you mentioned the uluru statement from the heart uh where uh, there are other demands that are not that have yet to be taken seriously even by the labor party and uh, mm-hmm. that for some of which includes uh, a makarata commission which is basically a truth and reconciliation commission uh that will be necessary uh, to come to terms with the history of colonization and what well, uh, well essentially genocide that actually did occur uh on the australian uh, continent and the uh, the stealing of land uh, and a whole host of other uh, atrocities that have been inflicted on them so uh these facts have to be uh, taken into this history it needs to be acknowledged if the government is actually serious about reconciling and you know extending reparations it has other means that does not require a constitutional process 
which is a very difficult process because of a referendum it will be a far more difficult process but since the government has a majority of its own it can definitely do uh, other uh, it can actually pursue other ways of uh, you know repairing some of the damages uh, historical damages and atrocities that have happened and you know coming to terms with uh, indigenous history a troubled history definitely but also a very rich and vibrant history uh that has often been ignored by the establishment and the mainstream so these facts can be these uh, actions can be taken but uh, right now obviously the setback in the setback this is not definitely um at the top priority obviously they are trying to uh, you know recoup from that especially those uh, indigenous activists who have been uh, working on the ground for years now to actually make this happen but obviously the failure is going to have a major impact on how the mobilization is going to go forward from here but again as i said if the government is uh, serious it can definitely go for other means of uh, you know making amends but uh, we do not see that forthcoming as of now all right uh, as uh, as anish rightly pointed out the executive and legislative branches Uh, of Australian government remain in the hands of Anthony Albanese and the Labour Party. So, so we shall see how they proceed on that front. Uh, we let Anish go for today, Anish, but don't go too far because we'll have you back on Daily TV uh, very soon. Uh, for now, our final bit for the day comes from uh, Geneva, where Public Services International is hosting or holding its World Congress, uh, including, of course, the Global uh, Unions Federation that represent over 30 million. Uh, public services workers around the world and of course the unions to which they belong uh, jyotsna singh is there uh, jyotsna the fundamental question i think has been asked by what you mentioned was the theme of the conference uh, to begin which is uh, how do you put people before profit in a world that is facing the kind of uh, you know multi fronted crises uh that we are talking about that we are reporting on and that many of us are actually living through at this point yeah uh thanks for having me on the show and yeah i am sitting in palexpo which is a huge convention hall in geneva um and uh, that is where the conference uh, or the congress is being held uh, so just to tell you a little uh, give you the a little background so public services international is a network of trade unions uh, which work in the public sector so these are the trade unions of the workers in the public sector um, so uh, there is uh, of course this strong uh, feeling that how important a uh, public sector is a uh, public provisioning of services is and the underlying theme constantly is uh, against privatization in fact we have seen presentations here over the past few days which talk about uh, not just that we have to fight privatization but something uh, that goes missing in a lot of debates which is deprivatization also that's happening uh, so the unions and the workers have been uh, and the working class Uh, has been fighting against privatization because obviously it leads to m- multiple crises uh, and uh, in some cases they have won and um, um, uh, for example in kenya uh, there was a presentation yesterday where the water services uh, in a particular province were uh, already privatized and there was pushed by some Uh, transnational corporations but how the workers of the sector came together and uh, then they agitated protested lobbied etc uh, and now there is a national law that the water won't be privatized so it was um, that case so that's happening um, but uh, what is the congress about is uh, so public services international was founded in 1907 and that is when they held their first congress uh, which brought uh, together uh, and the idea was to bring together the working class people from across the world uh, because uh, the might of the capital is such that it works as a global level it does not work at a small territorial level right um, so it is important that the workers also form those alliances across um, and ask for their rights uh, so this was 1907 um, and this congress happens every few years where uh, the unions which are members of there are 700 unions today which are members of uh, uh, psi Uh, and uh, in 154 countries uh, so every few years they come together uh, to uh, see which uh, what are the challenges and what direction should the uh, movement take uh, 
um, so that those are the deliberations that are happening and uh, that's why we are here and uh, the mood is not only bad which yeah we understand how the world looks like right now in fact yesterday i was hearing uh, i mean i was watching something and it said that you know if you put your finger anywhere on the world map today it pains uh, so uh, but at the same time because so many working class people have come together there is uh, you hear music like working class hero uh, solidarity forever you also hear slogans like water is a public good you can't sell mm-hmm. it um, so all of that so that is the larger mood and this is what the congress is about there are more than 1000 people here uh 12 to 1300 who are deliberating a range of issues um at the moment yeah jo uh, you jo sir rightly pointed out that that at times like these uh, i think solidarity uh, becomes something that all of us uh, draw strength from in various ways and also uh, demonstrations of this solidarity put pressure on uh, those who eventually make the decisions uh, to go in a different direction and in many cases we've seen trade unions and activists and organized labor taking the lead uh, wh- whether it's to do with pandemic recovery whether it's to do with climate action uh, whether it's to do with the state of the media like anish was pointing out and with, and this is, this is true uh, you know again uh, wherever you point your finger whether it's uh, ukraine or gaza or uh, australia as anish was just pointing out right now uh, we are all, there's also a great deal of as you were mentioning earlier intersectionality uh, the discussions on gender and reproductive rights in the wider context of uh, access to healthcare and, and and those kind of issues so 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 give us let's let's leave uh, our viewers uh, with a sense of that little bit of that positivity and that solidarity that that you are uh, witnessing at the moment um uh, so i think there are these certain cutting across themes which uh, give us a sense of um, um uh, what's happening at the global level and where the solidarity is emerging uh, one amazing thing that one sees is the number of healthcare work uh, young uh, workers who have come um and uh, from across sectors and uh, uh, this is something that psi has taken up also as a campaign that we need to have younger people uh, we need to talk to them we need to ask them what are their issues uh, so and uh, then there is also a huge presence of lgbtqi plus uh, 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 workers of across sectors uh, because that is a uh, something which is always pushed down the carpet and uh, uh, but the workers are saying it cannot happen anymore we need our rights we need recognition we need to show up as someone said um, so these uh, you we had one entire day discussing just the lgbtqi plus rights and issues and again there have been victories in many countries uh, for example ikea netherlands um, rec- uh, gives paid leave for gender transition to transgender people and now they are uh, uh expanding it to their uh, other uh, outlets across the world and that has happened because of the pressure that the workers and the, especially the, the all the workers so it is not just the duty of lgbtqi plus uh, to ask for their rights but the working class movement there itself took it upon itself to ask for these rights and there have been victories so you ke- you are hearing about it uh, you are hearing about how the uh, uh, working class is being paid low and there are shortages of stuff but in how they are talking to the governments and how they are protesting and agitating and trying to see that this should not continue um so th- these are the themes and um, uh, digitalization how that is actually not just taking away jobs but also becoming an ex- uh, an exploitative system and extractivism mm-hmm. in the capitalism um so uh, but people are standing up and therefore it is good to see in that sense that while we talk about challenges we are um, also talking about uh, 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 how to solve them and one thing that has emerged i think i must say this uh, in every single session is alliance building that you have mm-hmm. to form alliances uh, if, uh, if there are uh, doctors for example there was an example so doctors who are employed so employment itself had become a barrier for the union so they started to go to the unemployed doctors and those who are still in the colleges the mbbs colleges so how to form alliances across um, and all of that has produced results so solidarity and alliances i think is how you ensure people over profit not otherwise absolutely as you were pointing out uh, underlining the need for workers around the world to unite to combat issues that that seem that are bringing us together 
uh, in opposition, uh, but they are bringing us together. Thanks very much for reporting uh, on that uh, from Geneva for us, Dosna. Uh, we'll also wrap up this episode of Daily Debrief here. We've gone longer than our usual time. Uh, so very quickly, uh, a chance to ask you to uh, head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for details on all of these stories. We'll be back, of course, tomorrow uh, with more. Until then, stay safe. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.